Um, who's Scott cattle in this room right now? All right, who's wanting maybe maybe to get some cattle? I'm going to mostly focus on beef production tonight. I'm not going to go into the dairy industry. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Holstein feeder calves and stuff like that. But I, um, dairy industry is a totally different uh, beast, if you want to say it. We have about 12 dairies left here in Washington County. When I started 10 years ago, I think we had 31, 32 dairies. Uh, say 10 years before that, we would probably set 120, uh, you know, when it went from grade C to grade A and all that good stuff. Um, but besides an extension agent here in Washington County, I have my own cattle. Uh, I grew up in southern Greene County. I kind of got married a few months ago, that's what they say. So I moved to the northern side of the county, so however that works. But anyway, <laughs> we don't see each other that much. She's a teacher, and I, she's an ag teacher at that, so she has a lot of FFA things. So she understands, and I understand, so that's how it works out. But I've got about 95 mama cows that I run uh, in Greene County, so mostly commercial Angus. I run registered Angus bulls. Um, so to say beef production, I do it every day as well. Uh, when these days of these cold weather and these nights that are here, it makes it tough sometimes. I'll tell you that, and, uh, but we try to fight through it and do the best we can. Starting from, what do you have? You know, Where do you want to be? And, and this can go in any business situation but when do you want to start you know think about timing effects and we're going to kind of try to dive into some of these how will you know when you get there you know once you have a plan in place is that where you want to be or all right i've met my goals i want to continue all right what does it take to get there so put a little bit of financials to it i know you've already had some record keeping and some financials and all that uh, i'm not an economist but i could throw out some numbers to you tonight uh, boy they've changed tony in the past few months on the cattle production side of things uh, uh, and I know these guys that's going to talk to you have got cattle on their own, so they understand the beef cattle industry and, and markets. They do a lot of this, and right now, the past uh, six months uh, have been a roller coaster, that's for sure. So, got to be careful. And uh, I still think it's good. It's just, it was really good for a while. And uh, we kind of got down a little bit, so I'm by no means going to sit up here and tell you I predict the future because uh, that's been the wrong thing to do here lately. So, common essentials for raising cattle. I don't know, this is common sense, but some things you got to just think about land, owned or rented. You know, if, if you don't have much land, uh, you know, if, if you can work out deals with your neighbors and, and get a good relationship, renting's not a bad deal. Um, I'll tell you, the county average here in Washington County is about 20 to $30 per acre per year on a rented pasture and hay ground. Now, I'll tell you, the variation is about $0 to $150 per acre per year. You start getting into specialty livestock and all that stuff. Uh, a row crops you can get into 200 250 dollars per acre per year but, you know that's that's totally different but typically we do uh we do have resources that'll say 20 to 30 dollars per acre per year is what rented prices are stocking rate huh, that's another one you can uh you can argue that all day i'll tell you um soil has a lot to do with it what forages you're being, being able to raise on your ground how moist it stays there's a lot of differences there the old saying is uh, two acres per cow calf. I would say uh, yeah, it's anywhere from two to three. Uh, some people will, will push that hard and hard and hard. But again, they're feeding a lot of hay, they're feeding a lot of feed. Um, I've seen a lot of situations two head per acre. You know, you talk about feeder calf operations, things like that. Um, so it's more to the fact of how much feed you're wanting to put into your your cattle operation and all that so if you're trying to live off the land and uh, maybe purchase a little bit of hay you know if you start buying hay equipment uh, we could be here all night and spend a lot of money in a hurry if you want to start buying big tractors round bellers mowers all that stuff you'll sink a hundred thousand uh, dollars in a day in a hurry if you start getting in the hay business too much so so understand there's abilities to purchase hay square or round um, I didn't dive into that much tonight, but just understand those opportunities do exist that, that, that just to purchase hay instead of making hay. Um, when you're first starting out, that's probably the best idea. Um, water resources, you know, if, if you're starting out on your farm, think about where your water resources are and make sure it's clean, abundant, and fresh. Um, you know, ponds um, are, are good and bad. Um, I'm, I don't work for the NRCS, so I see a lot of stuff. Uh, I, you know, ponds, uh, this time of year when it's five degrees outside, uh, they freeze. Freeze in a hurry. So, um, you know, creeks and all that stuff, just, you know, what we'd like to see is a well and put some water tanks in 
Uh, they, they have a lot of those um, options within RCS that you can get money. Uh, so just understand water is very, very important. important. Fences make for good neighbors. And I'll tell you, I've had more neighbors call in fussing about their cattle farmer neighbor than in any place. I just, I, I always tell them, I'm education, I'm not regulatory. <laughs> and they don't like to hear that. They want an answer. So, uh, but anyway, fences is something that's very important in the cattle industry. Uh, I'm not going to dive into laws, but it is a, a, a fence out state in Tennessee. Uh, but uh, don't take that too far. Because what fence out means is if you've got a place in your yard that you don't want cows in, you have as much liability to fence those cows out of your yard as the farmer does fencing his cows in. So it's, it's a, it's a t sticky situation in Tennessee. Uh, I'm not going to say it's the best situation. And at the end of the day, if your cows get out enough, it's a nuisance. So there's ways to get around that stuff, and a good lawyer will find a way to say it doesn't matter if they didn't. So keep the cattle in. <laughs> um, I just kind of put some prices. Um, there is a variation. Um, um, this is like a six strand barbed wire on the left. Uh, this one's more of a page wire. I don't know if you can kind of see that, or a uh, woven wire per se with a barbed wire on top. Um, Two fifty to five dollars linear feet uh, is what uh, is what you'll have in this. Uh, I just put in a six strand uh, barbed wire fence. Uh, had a guy do it. Uh, I was a little over three dollars a square foot or linear feet on uh, it, and uh, uh, it was a fourteen gauge barbed wire. So there's a, there's a number of those things, but just understand a good fence that that would be more of a perimeter fence there. Uh, there is options. Uh, electricity uh, will keep a bull in quicker than anything. I'll tell you, you get a six-strand barbed wire and you get heifers that's in heat on the other side, uh, they're gone. <laughs> it doesn't matter. They'll figure it out. But a hot wire will keep them home. Okay. So uh, that's a six-strand. That's a high tensile wire on the left. Uh, that can be used for a perimeter. Uh, anybody know what this on the right is? It's not a very good picture, but it's poly wire. And it's on a reel. It's very portable and easy to move. Uh, changed my life when I was little. <laughs> I used to have to take that old wire out there and stretch it and you know all that good stuff. And then they come up with that and I said, oh, never going back. Um, because you can reel it up in, in 10 minutes. And, and the other good thing about this is, is, is uh, rotational grazing. You can kind of move, move fences uh, ever so often and really save your grass and kind of graze down to the height you need to. So. At least it's another option. Uh, very cheap, uh, so I say 40 cents to 250 on linear footage. 40 cents being more of the poly wire kind of deal, uh, something that's kind of more temporary. Although I've seen a lot of <laughs> borderline fences used with poly wire, and uh, you know, as long as it keeps them in, uh, they're very small strands of, of wire in that poly wire, poly rope, whatever you want to call. It. So what they do is have a connection in there. It's it's amazing. Some of them are six, some of them are nine wires deep in that poly wire. But fences, I, you know, I, and I start with this simple information, but it's very important. Fences, water, land. Uh, the other thing is weather protection. And I get some folks that have never been on the farm, and they think that every cow needs their own barn or their own stable. <laughs> and that is not the case. <laughs> and uh, boy, I have a hard time explaining that to some people. But wind breaks, you know, is something we need to think about. We've got a lot of hills in this countryside, you know, as natural wind breaks as you get. So right, that's that's wind breaks is what I'm thinking. Whether it be trees, uh, natural structures, uh, um, rocks, whatever else. Um, barns, they can be good or bad. And, and I kind of put some good on, or, you know, of course it's shelter. That's very important. You know, it's, it's an expensive shelter for the cattle. Uh, but they can harbor disease. If you don't clean those things out, if you don't get good air movement, uh, you can harbor some diseases in these barns and really cause yourself more harm than good. So be careful on that. Uh, clean, uh, you know, they like to hang out in those places, especially in the summertime. You know, they'll, oh, that's cool and shade and all that. And when they stand long enough, you know what they do. And then that becomes a mess over time. Crowding, uh, I would think about this on more of a cow-calf situation. Uh, you got little calves running into some muddy situations in the barn, and all of a sudden, you know, you get some weather like this, 
and uh, you got a cow laying on a calf and all of a sudden that calf dies because you crowded them in there. So just understand uh, there's only a limited space in those shelters. So just sometimes natural trees, uh, wind breaks and all that's it's just as good if not better. Uh, cedar tree will go a long way in, in this weather we got right now. Um, this, as you can see, I pulled two or three slides out of our advanced master beef. A lot of this information I'm telling you tonight, you'll see in, if you happen to take advanced master beef or whatever, this in much more detail. I'm going to hit the high notes, um, and please tell me when I'm about five minutes before. Um, Handling facilities, this is being able to work your cattle, load your cattle, you know, those are pretty important. You can't just turn them out and say, okay, I'm going to lasso you and we're going to bring you on home when we want to sell you. You know, that don't usually happen. So you need to think and plan these things out. And holding pens is just an area of what it says, is being able to sort the cattle or bring them in, whether it be crowd panels or whatever. Crowding pen, it's an area that allows the cattle to be funneled into a working chute. All right, and your working chute is that narrow act area right before we go into a squeeze chute or a working facility capable of capturing their neck, being able to give them shots, or if they're labor and labor and having trouble, you can go behind them and do your thing. Working area, that's uh, where they can be strained. I just talked about that. There's a number of them out there. There's blue ones, yellow ones, green ones, red ones, all kinds, uh, from $1,500 to Fifteen thousand dollars, you know. So there's a big expense to those. Sometimes more than others. Loading chute, I would say this is just an area that you can think <coughs> about where you're going to be able to load your cattle in a good place. There were some sturdy ground, um, something that doesn't stay moist a lot. Uh, maybe you need to rock a little bit and be able to get your um, trucks in. Types of cattle operation. All right, now I went all through this little tidbits of what we kind of need or think about to get started. Uh, but I want to talk about there's different types of cattle operations and uh, put a little name to it. And I thought that was kind of a pretty little picture of some black kids, maybe I'm a little partial. I tried to put some different colored cattle in here, but it seems like black's the one I always go to. So if you like a different breed, that's fine. The goal is to have a live calf every year, all right? Uh, a lot of folks go into a calving season. They like to have their, all their calves at the same time, so they pull their bulls and all that good stuff. So. Uh, that's typically what I do uh, mid-February uh, to March and April is my calves do uh, my time to calf. Uh, if everybody can remember what happened last February, <clears throat> it's pretty tough February to calf. <laughs> and uh, I hope that doesn't happen this year. I, I moved it back to February 14th. I'm going to have a good Valentine's Day this year. <laughs> uh, must have access to bull or artificial insemination. Um, so think about that, uh, whether you can rent a bull from your neighbor or a family member or you need to purchase a bull. Um, age of having calves is a <clears throat> two to however far. You know, a lot of times folks will calve their heifers out at two years old. Uh, money says that's where it's at. That's, that's the most money that you can get out of that cow for a lifetime is if you calve her out at two. If you take her out to three, you're going to put a lot more money into her and it's going to take long to get out there. Of course, she's bigger in size. So purchase from reputable sellers. Um, you know, if you're going to purchase uh, cows, you know, you purchase from someone that you know or trust or someone that you, uh, that, uh, that you know that they know somebody. You know, um, there's a lot of guys out here that will see you coming in a hurry uh, if you've never been in the cattle industry. So just understand there's special sales, there's sellouts. Uh, the Washington County Cattle Association, I'm their advisor. We have two heifer sales a year. Um, April 8th is our next one. Uh, we'll have probably 100 heifers or better in that sale. Bread, some will have calf beside of them, some will be open for you to take home to breed. So those are reputable heifers. Somebody's put their name beside of it and say, hey, I've got some quality here. So uh, same thing with the bulls. Um, you know, bulls is something that you need to purchase from a reputable source. I just worked a bull sale on a video bull sale today. Uh, average was $3,100 for the bulls. Uh, but they range from $1,400 to $7,200 for the bulls. So genetics plays a lot to do with uh, how much the cost of it is. Uh, the, the look of it, there's EPDs, which means what that bull's going to do. I've got numbers to tell you, is it going to be cavities or is it going to grow a lot, those calves. So we can put numbers to those. Heifers, um, the heifer market's all over the place right now. I'll tell you, uh, on average, heifers back in November was $2,000 for uh, breads. Uh, 
pairs was almost 3,000. Well, actually, they were over 3,000. I'll tell you, today's market, you're looking at somewhere 14 to 2,000 for heifers, probably somewhere in that 1,700, 16. Don't, don't quote me for this because this thing will change as soon as I tell you that. But somewhere in that range is 14 to 2,000, I would say, on bred heifers. Uh, pairs, uh, you're looking at somewhere around 6, to, well, that's cows. Probably heifers, you're looking at more like a 2,000 to 2,600 on, on pairs. Uh, if you're purchasing cows, I would say uh, four to five year olds, good uh, good age, four, five, six year olds. You're looking at bred cows anywhere from 1250 to 1800, and uh, pairs somewhere around 15 to 2000, 2200 being the top end. So you're going to put some money into this if you're going to purchase those large animals to go ahead and have those calves right off the bat. Um, those numbers that I told you about would have almost been doubled this time last year. So the cattle market has really taken kind of a, a hit. Um, I say double. Uh, bred heifers was about 23, 2400 instead of your 17, 1800 right now is what they are. So uh, of course in November they were 2000, 2100. So they kind of declined a little bit, but I'm just trying to give you some economics. Uh, if you start purchasing uh, open heifers, which means they're not bred, uh, you know, 500 pound <coughs> heifer is going to cost you about 700, 750 dollars. So of course it takes that 500 pound heifer another six, seven, eight months to get bred, which takes another nine months to have a calf. So you're looking at a year and a half before you have a calf, and then all of a sudden it takes seven months to to wean a calf. So you're looking almost two years before you financially get anything out of that 500 pound heifer calf. So that seven, seven hundred fifty dollars, you've also got feed and time and all that other stuff in. So uh, weigh those options out. What what about wean calves? Well, wean 500 pounds will be a weaning weight, five to six hundred. Yeah. Where's the arrow here? So purchasing bred cows, purchasing pears, I knew there was a slide on this, I got ahead of myself. Uh, purchasing open or bred heifers and bull purchases, we just talked about all that stuff. You know, bulls uh, are going to be in that two to $3,000 range. Most bulls are around here uh, that has any quality to them. It's going to be two to $3,000. Uh, four major factors that influence profitability in the cow-calf sector. A weaning weight, you know, seven months of age is what I kind of call majority. Some people will wean a calf at eight, nine months. Some may wean a little earlier. Uh, I would say around here, five to six hundred pounds is what you're kind of wanting to look for at a weaning size. Calf crop percentage wean. Whether you got ten cows and and nine of them had a calf, uh, but only eight of them weaned off because one of them died four months later. You know, you got to think about all those situations. So, market price for calves and cold cows. Uh, you always have to cull a cow. Well, cull a cow means just selling her off because something's wrong with her, whether it's bad udder, bad feet, bad attitude, whatever. And then annual cow cost. Uh, that varies. Um, depends on how much feed, how much grass, hay, all that stuff. That's what a cow cost is. Um, vaccines, vet bills, that is everything that it puts in your farm. You need to divide that by how many cows that you've got. And that's what that all that number comes to. I'm not going into that. I just thought it was good to have that on your sheet to kind of see, put some projections to it. That way you can kind of do some math as you get to thinking about maybe having a cattle operation. So weaning weight, calf crop percentage weaned times market price minus annual cow cost gives you hopefully what you're going to profit out of your cow. So, so there's a backgrounding operation. I went to cow calf. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about backgrounding because. A lot of folks that I talk to uh, that comes in the office, I've never done cattle, I bought 30 acres, I want to put cattle in, you know, and, and they want to instantly think about cow calves and then all of a sudden I start throwing that 2,000, 2,200 out and they figure out 15 heads going to cost them $30,000 up front and they're like, wait a minute here, is there something else? Uh, and then I get this sometimes, purchase uh, in calves and placing pounds on them is what background and operation basically is, kind of in, in toned down terms. But bottle calves can actually be a backgrounding or a feeder calf operation. Now, is it uh, highly risky? 
Oh yeah, if you've never raised bottled calves, uh, it can be 5% death loss or you could lose the whole crop. You get a disease, uh, uh, something goes wrong, you lose them all in a hurry. So uh, I will say have your veterinarian to uh, have that cell phone handy if that happens. Um, colostrum in all calves, so if you've got a cow-calf operation, when those calves hit the ground, they need to nurse that mama within 24 to 48 hours, preferably within that first 24 hours. It's very critical. Uh, those are um, live antibodies uh, that protect them against a lot of diseases. If they don't get that colostrum, uh, most of the time they won't live. If they do live, they just are, they, they never end up being to their full potential. So uh, if you're purchasing bottled calves, a lot of times you get them when they're four or five days old. You need to get them from a reputable source that understands, yeah, I got colostrum in them, or I understood that cow, uh, that calf nursed that cow. There is, they either freeze the colostrum and they give it to them and they know. Uh, they purchase colostrum in the bags um, at your local feed store. Uh, so there, there is things to do that. But don't think you can buy a four day old calf and go give it some colostrum and say, well, if they didn't do it, remember what I said, 24 to 48 hours. I get a lot of folks that, well, I just give them some colostrum when I got them. That should be good. Well, if they're three or four days old, that, that, that does nothing other than give them some, some milk replacers. I'll basically do it. So milk replacer, starter feed, you start buying a $70, $80 bag of milk replacer, and starter feed being a $10, $12, a 50-pound bag, you start tying into some money. Now it's over a period of time. You're going to wean those calves at about 6 to 8 to 10 weeks, uh, Depending on how good you are, most people is eight to ten weeks on a bottle. Um, who's got cattle in this room right now? All right, who's wanting maybe maybe to get some cattle? I'm gonna mostly focus on beef production tonight. I'm not gonna go into the dairy industry. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Holstein feeder calves and stuff like that. But I, um, dairy industry is a totally different uh, beast, if you want to say it. We have about 12 dairies left here in Washington County. When I started 10 years ago, I think we had 31, 32 dairies. Uh, say 10 years before that, we would probably set 120, uh, you know, when it went from grade C to grade A and all that good stuff. Um, but besides an extension agent here in Washington County, I have my own cattle. Uh, I grew up in Southern Green County. I kind of got married a few months ago, that's what they say. So I moved to the northern side of the county, so however that works. But anyway, <laughs> we don't see each other that much. She's a teacher, and I, she's an ag teacher at that, so she has a lot of FFA things. So she understands, and I understand, so that's how it works out. But I've got about 95 mama cows that I run uh, in Greene County, so mostly commercial Angus. I run registered Angus bulls. Um, so to say beef production, I do it every day as well. Uh, when these days of these cold weather and these nights that are here, it makes it tough sometimes, I'll tell you that, and, uh, but we try to fight through it and do the best we can. If you're buying these little pretty little black and whites, uh, which I used to run a bunch of those, uh, you're going to dehorn them, all right? You're going to worm them, you're going to vaccinate them, uh, if you want to get top of the market in those things. You know, there are special steer sales for these Holsteins. Uh, if you're going to purchase bottle calves, if you're going to find any availability, which is down there at the next, it's mostly going to be your dairy calves because a beef calf is going to be raised on her mama. All right, that's the whole sole purpose of them. These are getting pulled off because some milk's going into the tank. Um, so availability, uh, if you're going to sell them in special steer cells, they're going to want those horns off. They're going to want them graded in number one or number two, which means a good muslin. So uh, just read up on those if that's something that you want. Cost and grading is what I just said. Uh, background in beef calves. This becomes a little bit more of an art. Uh, you've got to understand what you're doing on this as well, but it's a good opportunity if you can purchase from somebody locally that you know. Uh, maybe not going to the stockyards. Uh, that can be to some disease problems there. Uh, Co-mingling. They can be some traded calves that uh, have made it to four states in three days and finally ended up on your farm. Uh, those things do happen sometimes, but the, the understanding of this is a lot of folks like to uh, purchase a few calves in the spring and sell them in the fall. Now I'll tell you what the uh, market dynamics on, on that, Tony, is not always the best, is it? You know, when you're purchasing high price in spring, because everybody's got grass, they're wanting those high dollar young calves that's going to put pounds on, and typically eight to nine times out of ten, fall is your lower times. The past year or two, 
it's been different, but I guarantee you, uh, well, last year was not different, but two years ago was very different. <clears throat> but so understand risk as far as prices, if you're, if you're buying high in spring and selling low, that's kind of defeating economics, right? Buying high, selling low, it's supposed to be buying low, selling high, right? So, so if you do buy low and sell high, when is that? You're buying in the fall and selling in the spring. So what do you get to do all winter long? Feed. Get to feed, right? <laughs> in this. So that's the whole purpose of why they're buying them a little cheaper is to go through the winter time and you got to have some feed resources or, or something. So sickness, I would put that on my top of my list is understanding uh, vaccinations are, are key. Uh, better <coughs> facilities, if not dairy calves. If you're not purchasing dairy steers, which are pretty easy to keep at home, keep at bay, but you start weaning calves off of mamas, they've had a good life most of their life if their mama had some milk to her. Uh, so they feel pretty good. If you take them away from mama, they're going to find a way to try to find mama. It don't matter if they can't hear her. They're gonna, if there's not a good facility and not a good fence, uh, these calves will try to find an alternate place. I don't care how good you think you are to them. Uh, that's just nature of beef calves. Price volatility and risk, uh, market trends, study those a little bit if, if you're thinking about doing this. Uh, and available feed resources if you're going to do a fall to spring kind of deal. Uh, you're going to have to probably have some supplemental feed. The good thing about the spring to fall is typically grass and maybe a little bit of ground feed uh, will take you a long way with those kids. Just understand market volatility could play into those things. With all this being said, I've not talked about markets. I'm not going to talk about them much tonight. Uh, they're out there, market opportunities once you sell calves and cattle. Um, stock barns is one place. Uh, uh, there is some co-mingling groups that you can sell with other people uh, into load lots. Most of our cattle are shipped out west. Some of them are shipped up north. Uh, but I, anybody, Can anybody tell me how many thousand pounds goes on a tractor trailer load of cattle? Can anybody tell me? I know there's two or three in this room that can. <laughs> 48 to 50,000 pounds. So it's not really a number of head, it's a number of pounds, right? Because they're going to stick them on there and get that as much weight. I mean, it's still a trucking dynamics. They want to hit as many pounds as they can before they get turned back on the scale. So 48 to 50,000 pounds. So if you're selling a 700 pound calf, uh, that would be um, 70 calves, 49,000 pounds. So it's hard to buy 70 calves uh, on today's market. Uh, so just understand we've got some opportunities maybe to, to market with other folks as well. Uh, replacement heifers, this is another thing that people like to do sometimes, buy a five or six hundred pound heifer, developer, whatever, uh, breeder. Um, you can develop heifers for producers, whether it's beef or dairy. You know, that, that was a good thing for a lot of folks when we had a lot of dairy farms around. Dairy farmers didn't have enough time to replace or develop their own heifers, they, they paid somebody else to do it, you know, and that's how they develop. Well, beef cattle, the same way. There's a few people that develop heifers for, for other people. Uh, you can develop heifers for sales. We have some folks in our heifer sales. They pick out uh, 20 heifers, well, 15 is their max, so 15 heifers out of their group of cattle. I'm going to sell these heifers. They're going to your sale in, in April. You're, they're going to your sale in November, and we have a lot of repeat sellers that develop for our, our sales in uh, in Washington County. Uh, must be bred to a Cavanese bull. I don't, you know, whatever you're doing, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be an Angus bull, but just understand if you're doing dairy heifers, uh, well, the good old days of breeding to a Holstein bull for these heifers have about finally gone away with that and they're going to an Angus bull or a Jersey bull or something like that that's a lot more of a Cavanese. Reputation is key for success. I'd say that's in the cattle industry, any other industry as well. Um, you're putting your name to what you're marketing, especially with these heifers. Now, reputation is key because in our, our sales, we put your name beside of those heifers. Uh, if you brought, try to bring heifers back next time and you didn't bring good ones next time, those folks will remember. We'll remember in a hurry. Um, seed stock, that is registered. That's when you have a purebred, uh, whether it be Angus, Simital, Charlay, throwing out a bunch of breeds. Um, genetics and reputation. You need to understand what genetics are. Um, you can't just go out and buy two cows and say I'm in a registered business uh, and not understand the dynamics of that. Uh, uh, if you don't have an understanding of someone that can AI your cattle or at least play the genetics games, um, your reputation is never going to get to that point. 
we've got some very good breeders in the area. I'll tell you, some of the best in the state when it comes to registered cattle in here, and uh, and they make good money, but they spend a lot of money too. You know, they don't go out and buy the three thousand dollar bulls to breed their cows. They're going out and buying the thirty, forty thousand dollar bulls, fifty thousand dollar bulls. Um, ET and AI. Anybody know what ET stands for? Embryo transfer. That's where they're taking an egg out of one great cow and putting her in a subpar cow and they can put a lot of genetics out there of that particular great cow all right and AI of course is artificial insemination that's taking that hundred thousand dollar bull that I can't afford and I'm gonna pay thirty dollars for a semen straw and I've got about a 65 percent chance that that cow is gonna get bred by that hundred thousand dollar bull all right bull and heifer markets um, you need to study those because you're as, as a seed stock producer you're going to be selling to people that are breeding commercial cows, just great cows, not really registered. And heifer markets, you know, uh, uh, that, that's your two big potentials. You're not probably going to take these registered calves and take them to a sell barn, you know, regular stockyard. So you've got to understand bull and heifer markets. Breed variation, uh, sale prices, um, genetics, um, age of puberty, all that is breed variation is, is a huge deal and I will tell you I, I keep going to Angus but in this area uh, that breed and I'll tell you most of the country uh, black Angus has hit um, they're just way ahead of the game so it, it's okay to pick another breed but understand your bull market your heifer market is not going to be what those black Angus are I mean it's I don't care how good genetics are you are I've seen some really good Paul Hartford bulls today, thousand dollars cheaper than than the Black Angus. It's just the, it's the way it is. Not to say that they weren't good Paul Hartford bulls. It just it's it's where it was today. Um, wholesale beef is another thing. When you start talking about selling beef out of out of your freezer and all that good stuff, if you want to sell halves and holes and quarters and all that, you know, grass fed or um, all natural and all that good stuff. I'm not going to dive into that a lot tonight because I'll tell you what, that would take months to figure out. But I will tell you there is a great place to, to read a lot more about uh, selling beef out of your truck and out of your home and rules and regulations. If you are not one that wants to read about rules and regulations, this is probably not for you. All right. I'm not saying that they're overwhelming you with it, but I'm just saying at least understand the dynamics. Um, it's not that difficult to do that. Do y'all sell some down there? Yeah. 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 So the labeling is pretty simple, but they do have to abide by those rules, right? Yeah. And TDA, Tennessee Department of Agriculture, is where you do those rules and regulations. Uh, but Center for Profit Ag has worked a lot with TDA uh, to be able to put a lot of brochures and pubs and all that good stuff. And I kind of put that on there. Hopefully you can see that on your sheet if you ever want to go back to that website. So. Just a few other tidbits. What is temperament? Uh, that's, are they crazier? All right. <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, one bad apple in the group can mess up a, a bunch of good apples up. Also known as high-headed, aggressive, wild, and skittish. Uh, boy, if I could think about or understand what some of them were thinking sometimes, I'd sleep a lot better tonight. <laughs> fight or flight. Now, if they're going to fight me, they don't stay at my home very long at all. If they're flighty, if they're new, I may give them a little bit of time, but if I can't work with them, they don't stay long. All right, natural defense against predators, so we are a predator to them. All right, once they get used to you, they come around, you don't become a predator. They can smell you. Uh, they will get used to one person. If they only see one person at a time, you start bringing your neighbor beside of you, for the first time, what do they do? They throw them ears up, right? They're like, what's going on? Somebody new. For the individual in calves, all right? So that... Uh, they're very protective of their calves, all right? Uh, you start getting around their calves and all that good stuff when they're born, I don't care how much you petted mama when she was three weeks from calving, all right? She'll kill you sometimes. Uh, I had one about the, the other day. I said, you got it. I'm done. <laughs> I stopped touching them and I walked away. That's the best way to do it because they will hurt you. Um, we talked a little bit about this, so I'm going to show a few pictures of what cows should and should not look like. This is what... Most cows should look like, and I made sure this wasn't a jersey because a lot of times jerseys are totally different. This is not a jersey. 
All right, this is not a dairy cow. Dairy cows are different. But we can actually put body condition scores on cattle of what they look like and should look like. Should cattle look like this? No. Either they've had a calf and something's went wrong or their age or you're just not feeding them enough, right? All right. So little evidence of body fat, severe muscle loss, spineless process feels sharp and can easily be seen. So all those sh sharp points. Uh, cow is not weak. Um, so that means there could be a one, right? So one means basically they're really weak. They can barely, they're wobbling. So we go from a one to nine scale. So I decided I was going to pick a two. I think I picked it to five and a nine. So I wanted to show you the three spectrums. It takes, if this cow was to breed and get bred and all that stuff, she's going to need to gain two or three hundred pounds to get to that point just to breed back. All right, so it's so a lot of weight loss there. If she had a calf, if not, hopefully you're not underfeeding those cows. But just look at that. This is what a six. I put a six. Uh, you want to have your cows looking at a five or six. You don't see any pointed out bones on her, do you? All right. When she's calving at a six, she's going to go down about a five, five and a half. And if you're feeding them decent, you don't even have to be feeding them feed. Just feeding them good hay and all that good stuff or good grass, they're going to get back there. All right, ribs not seen and hard to feel, hind quarter plump and full, sponginess to cover uh, the four ribs and beside the, behind the tail, beside the tail right there. So that's just kind of a ideal cow. See, that's on a black cow. You see that right there? It's pretty. All right, so we got a full Hartford in this group. All right, so that's a body condition score of a six. There's a nine. I try not to get them to a nine, but every once in a while I'll look out there and I'll have a nine. I don't mean to. <laughs> but there's, it's not good to really have a nine. It really isn't because what happens is they don't breed back as well. All right, their milk potential. If you get too much fat in their milk supply, it can hinder their milk production to that calf. So, so breeding back is very important. Right, we want to have a calf every year. We want to raise a good calf. So if she's too fat, she's not going to milk as good. Not going to have as good a calf. Other thing is that cow probably don't weigh just a thousand pounds. She probably weighs more like 15 to 1,600 pounds. Does she eat a lot more than that 1,000 to 1,100 pound cow? Oh, yeah. yeah. The dynamics is still there in cows as it is in people. All right? Bigger cows eat more. So she better wean a bigger calf. Bull to female ratio, this is something that I get a lot of questions asked. Varies with nature of the pasture, um, the bull's age and condition. You know, a young bull may be able to cover a little bit more, but not too young of a bull. All right? and length of the breeding season and others. So if you have a set breeding season and they're working really hard for about 45 to 60 days uh, and you turn them out on 50 cows, that's not going to work. All right, that's not going to work. So here's kind of the thing, the rule of thumb, is one female per month of the bull's age up to 36 is the useful rule of thumb. Now, we try to say a yearling bull, which is 12 months old, be careful on him. If you've got to use him as a breeding bull, five or eight cows would be the most of a yearling bull. So we really like to say 16 to 18 months of age uh, bull, you can start using 15, 16, 17 uh, cows at that point in time. So 18 on, I would say, is, is that point. So if you've got a four-year-old bull, hopefully he can cover 35, 36 cows. Now, again, there is some variations, but that is a good rule of thumb. So I dip back to the cow calf a little bit. Breed a bull. There's more variation between bulls than between breeds um, to a certain extent. However, low birth weight English breeds, so if you're interested in learning more about breeds, look up English breeds, may have an advantage over continental breeds. Continental breeds are bigger boned, larger muscled, so if they're bigger bones, that means their babies are bigger bones and they got to go through a hole about like that, right? So if their bones are bigger, that hole don't get much bigger, all right? So English breeds just have a smaller bone structure. But if you get good genetics, those English breeds can grow, for the most part, as, as well as, as continentals. Uh, so cabin difficulties, if you've never done it before, you need to talk to somebody that has, a vet. Uh, lighter calves are born easier than heavier ones. Uh, larger heifers will have them better than eight, uh, smaller heifers. Sometimes I, I question that. but. Uh, that was uh, something that we put together. 
Uh, generally using genetically low birth weight sires is the easiest way to prevent calving difficulty. So understand if you're purchasing a bull, say is this easy calving bull, is this something I'm going to have problems calving. So that, if a producer uh, has sold registered cattle long enough, they'll understand in no time what you're talking about, uh, birth weights. Research has not shown shape of the calf to predict calving problems, so there's still no evidence of that, of being able to figure out, oh, the shape of the calf inside there is going to, it's going to be easy calving and ultrasounds and all that. Um, so forage is cheap, right? Grass, hay to a certain extent, but I'll tell you, hay has gotten a lot more expensive over the past two or three years. Uh, we had a really dry year last year, which kind of rose prices up. There's a lot of trucked in and hay, uh, but it's that's your success as a cattle operation. You need to understand forages, uh, fertilizing your fields, uh, whatever else. Uh, so pasture hay must be of adequate quality and quantity. Um, is this good quality hay? What's growing on top of there? Grass. Grass seed from the hay that they build up, right? So that means the quality Oh, that hay was pretty ripe, so it's it's growing another crop on top there, so it's getting double dose, right? <laughs> it's stored outside, right? Stored on the ground. I know you can't hardly see this, but cows or cows have got in there and been able to eat what they want to, all right? So they're wasting a lot. So understand that this is pretty valuable. Don't want to waste as, as much as we can. Uh, so here's some some just kind of things that I put on there so you can read it as we go. I know I'm probably getting close to time. <coughs> um, this one, is this saving hay? Can everybody see this? And I'll tell you, there's certain times of year it's almost hard to avoid. <laughs> I've got two acres of concrete and I've still got mine. <laughs> but this is not mine though. <laughs> this is not mine, I promise you. All right, manage hay feeding. Uh, use your hay range, use some some areas that, that doesn't have a whole lot of mud pit. Does cattle, would cattle gain well or would they, they be healthy in this situation? Well, no, they're, 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 they're putting a lot of their energy to fighting, kicking up that mud and walking through that mud. So um, in situations, if you're calving out in really cold weather, unrolling some of those hay bales uh, to give them some bedding and, and uh, warmth uh, during these kind of situations might be okay. Cut strings, especially if you've got those uh, old uh, um, plastic strings, because uh, as soon as you don't do that, the bush hog will catch them or the disc mower wheel, and you'll be out there saying, what did I do last winter? So make sure you do that. Mis miscellaneous tidbits. And, and again, I could have spent 10 hours on this thing, but I just thought of a few things. Identification is one thing. Ear tags, you know, number system, whatever works for you is fine. If you want to ear tag them, um, it's good. It's a good Sorry. situation. I'm a, I'm a mover, that's for sure. Okay. Uh, identification, um, you don't see any brands, freeze or hot brands much around this area, so uh, most of the time this guy has an S49, um, whatever, it, it, that's up to you on how you do that. Just number it in a situation, keep your record keeping, keeps up uh, if you're having a calf hit the ground. Uh, at least understand it'd be nice to identify those kids. Vaccinations, I'm not going to dive into vaccinations. I did print off a copy. That is uh, from one of the veterinarians at Mountain Empire. Uh, he typically comes to our uh, advanced master beef and we'll go over vaccinations because I always get well, what kind of shots do I need to give my cattle? What do I need to do? That's kind of a list that he put together. So one of those sheets that I had on the table, it's not a part of the PowerPoint, it's another sheet over there on the table. Uh, of all kinds of veterinary or vaccines. Veterinary contact info, I think I have about four or five vets in my phone from about two or three different counties. <laughs> I will get a hold of somebody if something's going wrong. Uh, and I don't get to call them at midnight sometimes too. Uh, but that's something that's very important. Mineral, um, it's, it's like us. We need minerals, we need vitamins. So does cattle, they need some, some minerals more important at certain times of year than others. Uh, spring time of year, we need high mag. There's not enough magnesium in that grass. Uh, we can get some tetany problems, which is, a, is kind of a milk fever. Uh, it can lock their system up and they can fall over and die. All right? So basically, um, if they don't get some magnesium in them in the springtime, uh, 
that, that's important. So high mag in the springtime is pretty important for, for cattle mineral. Uh, fly control and pink eye, yeah, those cattle get pink eye. Uh, they scratch their eyes, whether it be for flies or um, you get tall seed heads and all that stuff. That irritant will trigger pink eye, and when one gets it, about half of them gets it, right? Sometimes all of them get it. So uh, pink eye's a problem because it can damage that cornea of that eye. Uh, boy, I've seen some that looks like the eyeball's about to fall out. It can be so bad. So, so some, some big problems. But fly control is our big thing because those flies can move that, uh, that matter or whatever you want to call it in, in their eye, that, that disease, that pink eye, and it can move it to the other animals. So we want to keep the flies off. If the other thing is, if they got a million flies on their back, they're going to walk out there and eat grass because those flies are going to bite them and they're already hurting. And then the sun's baking down, so they're going to stay in the shade because flies don't like to stay in the shade as much, but they will. So we need a good fly control, whether it be fly tags or, or some type of pour-on on the back or some kind of rubber. Uh, so fly control is a huge deal come spring, summer, and fall. And then record keeping. Uh, I don't care if it's a little notebook. I don't care if it's a notebook on your truck. Uh, I think you've talked about record keeping already. A uh, good friend of mine. Uh, I've known him for a long time, so hopefully he done a halfway good job. But anyway, record keeping is a very important. Uh, just allows you to understand what you got, where you're going. All that stuff I talked about the first slide, right? So that record keeping is pretty important. Additional info, we talked about other resources that you can come up with because I'm sure not telling you everything in 45 minutes. So utbeef.com, that is the Beef and Forage Center of University of Tennessee. I'll tell you, they have come a long way when it comes to publications and more information on beef cattle and, and forages and all that good stuff, and that's where you go to that. There's some beef cattle budgets, so if you want to actually manually go in there and type some numbers in, they've actually made it interactive now to where you can punch some numbers in if you understand some dynamics of pricings and you start pricing either cattle or, or fences or feed or all that, you can kind of type that in there and it'll spit out a number uh, on the budgets. Uh, Tennessee Department of Agriculture's Ag Enhancement Program. Again, that's that's a sign-up period for um, so many minutes. Uh, um, so many minutes. So many, uh, I've seen the five minutes. <laughs> so many uh, producers will sign up every year. Um, I think we got $352,000 in Washington County last year. Uh, that was June 1st through June 7th on genetics, uh, working facilities, uh, hay barns, livestock feeding equipment, a lot of those things. So, now, And all that requires 30 head or more? 30 head, uh, and I'm not the one who does the counting of the head. And I'll tell you, if you have John Hodges come, I don't know if you are or not, but he, uh, he will tell folks, well, if you got 15 cows, they're going to have 15 calves in the year. So put down 30. <laughs> if you got 26, put down 30. I mean, he goes to that point of if you got 12 or 14 and you are look like you could have 30 or going to that point, put 30. Now, again, he could, he could not be the man that, you know, if he quits and somebody else comes in there and they said, where's your 30 head? Then, you know, well, John Hodges told me to put 30 head down. But in the 10 or 12 years, I don't think he's ever counted cattle, and that's what he'll tell you when he steps up here. That's, that's what the application says is 30 head. So if you're getting to that point, again, I don't know when the application will come out this year. Um, typically it's been June 1st or June 7th, but I'll tell you they, they've pushed all these programs uh, to get turned in by September 1st, and it's usually been May 1st. So there's so many applications this year, they're trying to figure out how to do that. So I'm assuming that June 1st is going to be moved back a little bit. Uh, we already talked about the advanced master beef producer, but there's a lot of information in that. So um, each county, or or uh, there's a lot of counties that do it. We cover three or four counties in, in, in Washington County when we do it. Uh, but we actually cover about eight, but we acknowledge four counties. But uh, there's a lot more county or more county participation than just the four that's mentioned. And then Extension is a great place, NRCS, I didn't put that on there, I'm sure it's already already been mentioned. They don't know beef. Well, they do. <laughs> they have a lot of Some. lot of money yeah. on, a, on a fencing, inside fences, um, watering systems, they can help you with water systems, fencing. Um, sometimes the way you feed your cattle and stuff, they can do some, 
uh, feeding situations, if you've got a really muddy situation. So there is some ways to do that. So NRCS does have some money with that. Um, that will help a lot of cattle farmers in this, this, this county, that's for sure. But the extension, uh, you've got my information. Email me. Uh, call me, however, I'll try to help you any way I can. Uh, we do come out sometimes and look at things when uh, the weather's better than what it is out there right now, that's for sure. But uh, I try to cover the